Mick Sweeney. Mick Sweeney, sorry. Um, Patrick uh, came down from Toledo to do this talk with us. Um, he gave this talk at Hedgehash. So, thanks for coming. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Patrick. Um, so, as you said, this is a, uh, a talk I gave at CodeMash, which is a uh, developer conference that happens once a year in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, and this talk is specifically about web design. Uh, so I apologize to any non-web designers in the audience, um, but I think you should stick around anyways. Um, I think you might get something out of it still. <coughs> so uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way. So you, you're aware that I uh, originally wrote this for a specific audience, uh, you know, even though this is a general UX group. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting time to be a uh, web designer. There's been a lot of changes that have happened over the past few years. Um, it wasn't that long ago that you could get away with um, doing a fixed width layout and um, just hard coding all of your, uh, hard coding everything in pixels. Uh, and that seems like it's ancient hi history, even though that was only, you know, four or five years ago that you could still do that. Um, and there's been a lot of changes that have happened really quickly and um, haphazardly in some cases. And I think in uh, some cases, um, instead of these changes uh, being done in a way that benefits the user experience, I think it's actually been uh, detrimental to the user experience. And I think the um, case where this is the most true is when you're browsing uh, the web on large screens. So um, a user who's browsing the web on large screens uh, in, th in this day and age, um, they're likely to notice a few things. Um, they're, they're likely to have to do a lot of scrolling. I know that when I, uh, I'm browsing the web, um, I, Whenever I load a web page, uh, I almost always have to um, scroll beneath what is initially loaded um, because the content that's initially presented to me is not what I'm actually looking for or what I actually need from the web page. And then um, there's a lot uh, more scrolling that goes on uh, just to find the content that you're, that you're looking for. Um, and there's a few things contributing to that. Um, one is the rise of uh, single column layouts. Um, and these do not use space very efficiently. And, um, in a large way contribute to the uh, large amount of scrolling that you have to do uh, nowadays that um, just a few years ago wasn't uh, necessary. Also, um, there's a prevalence of having unnecessarily large elements on the page. Uh, for instance, um, having like hero text that's uh, really large, uh, or, or sorry, having hero images that are really large or having header text that's uh, much bigger than it needs to be. Uh, and these can occupy uh, more space on, this, on the screen than is necessary. Uh, and, and that leads to you have to do a lot of scrolling as well. Also, um, users uh, these days are likely to notice that um, information uh, tends to be presented to them in grid format rather than using uh, tables. So um, basically, uh, a lot of websites, they like to have, present information in self-contained boxes uh, so they can move around on the screen easily. Um, however, when you're trying to uh, scan a lot of information at once, uh, this can make it hard to uh, d digest. It, it takes a lot of uh, mental energy. Um, also, uh, another uh, trend is that navigation is often hidden from the user, uh, even when there's more than enough room to display at least some of it to them. And, um, and, and this doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, why would you want to have your user to go through an extra step to find what they're looking for? Or why would you want to hide from them um, what you want them to see? And I think, um, to some degree, uh, designers are tending to overlook uh, the larger screens in favor of smaller screens. And there's kind of a tendency on the part of a lot of people to think that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of growth in, uh, you know, browsing on phones, and that's the future, so that's what we need to focus on. However, I think that's uh, misguided, and any designer um, who gets too caught up in that is uh, making a mistake. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Um, People are still browsing the, uh, the web on larger screens, and they're likely to keep doing that for the foreseeable future. Um, there's already an established user base of people who, um, you know, who've been browsing the web on a desktop or a laptop for 10, 15, 20 years, and that's the way they're going to do, do it. And with technology, a lot of people like to stick with what they're familiar with. So there's a lot of people who aren't going to give up um, you know, browsing on uh, the larger screens in favor of their phones anytime soon. Also. Tablets are getting larger. I've seen tablets that are, you know, 20, 24 inches. So uh, tablets can actually be larger than a lot of uh, laptop or desktop monitors in, in some cases. Also, um, some people make the mistake of thinking that uh, the growth in mobile browsing is coming at the expense of desktop browsing. 
And, and I think it's more accurate to say that the growth in mobile browsing complements uh, desktop browsing. And it, it is true that desktop browsers occupy a smaller share of the market and, than they used to, and that's likely to continue. Um, however, I think that's more uh, caused by the market overall getting larger than a sharp decline in desktop browsers. Um, also, there's always going to be specific use cases where you know, larger screens make more sense. So if, if you have a web application um, that is going to be used, uh, that, that you know, isn't really going to be usable on a phone, but can be usable on a larger uh, screen, it, it makes more sense to design in favor of the larger screen than the smaller screen. <laughs> so I think it's uh, important to just take a moment and consider how we uh, got to this point. Like I said, there's been a lot of changes that have happened really fast and you know things are still changing as, as we speak but um, it, it's worth just trying to uh, get, get an idea of how we got to this point. Um, I think by far the biggest factor driving this is there's just more uncertainty uh, these days than ever in terms of the um, types of uh, screens that people are going to be um, using to load your web page. Uh, there's all kinds of different um, you know phones or, or uh, uh, tablets um, so Really, when someone's um, accessing your web page, they could be accessing it um, from anything as small as the phone that's in your pocket to you know, something as big as this uh, you know, projector screen here. And that's kind of terrifying to think about, but you know, that's the world we live in, and, and we have to uh, learn how to deal with it. Also, um, there's uh, in, an increasing use of uh, high-resolution displays from some manufacturers, so you can't even take it for granted what kind of um, resolution people are using to access your web page either. Um, so by far the uh, biggest way that uh, designers and developers have uh, tried to adapt to these challenges that I just listed in terms of screen sizes and resolutions is through the use of uh, media queries. And uh, media queries have been around for a while, but they've gotten a lot more powerful in the past few years, and they allow you to uh, selectively apply styles to your content based on things like um, screen size and resolution. And so it's a really powerful tool, and, and it has influenced the way uh, a lot of people design and, and develop uh, over the past few years. And uh, another big factor is the uh, rise in popularity of uh, CSS frameworks. Um, Probably the, the most well-known is Bootstrap, and there's a lot of other wells, ones out there. And a lot of these frameworks um, have grid systems that you can use to uh, lay out your content for you. And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of designers, um, instead of building on top of the frameworks, um, they kind of let the frameworks do the design for them, and it ends up being more of a, a constraint than a, a, a tool. And I think that leads me into my uh, next point, and I think a big reason that a, a lot of uh, you know, designers and developers uh, over, -rely, over rely on frameworks is because CSS is it's hard. And I don't mean that as a criticism of the language itself. It's just that um, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, practice and knowledge that goes into getting really good at it. But um, when you're first learning the basics, it, it seems deceptively easy, you know, because just about anyone could set the background color of an element or the font size of a paragraph text or something like that. But um, so a lot of people, they just see, think that it's, it's really easy and they don't need to spend a lot of time getting good at it. So um, they never really take the time to uh, really master it. And uh, for those reasons, I think there's just not enough good CSS developers out there. And I think um, a lot of uh, designers and developers end up going with the design solution that they know how to implement, really, rather than the one that um, is the best or makes the most sense for their particular situation. Excuse me. Um, and I, th I think we also can't ignore the role of semantics. Uh, if you've had anything to do with web design over the past few years, you've probably heard a lot of, about the following terms, uh, mobile first design, adaptive design, and responsive design. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I think the people who started using these terms um, had good intentions, but unfortunately, they've been kind of misinterpreted and misapplied by a lot of people over the years, uh, the last couple of years, um, to the point that um, they're no longer really useful or, or um, uh, good to even discuss. And, you know, I, I could do an entire presentation going over the different interpretations and different ways of looking at these terms, but I don't think that would be very interesting. Um, but I will say that um, I think the biggest way that these terms have been, uh, you know, misinterpreted um, or misapplied is that a lot of people have taken them to mean that they need to um, seemingly uh, rethink their approach to design. Um, 
and, and kind of uh, just have a, a new way of, of, of doing design. Uh, but when you get rid of the, uh, the prefix part, the mobile first, the adaptive, and the responsive, all you're left with is design. And if there's only one thing you take away from this talk, even if you completely uh, zone out or you know, just look at your phone the rest of the uh, presentation, I, I hope you remember that you know, user, when you're focusing on the user, your approach to, to design should not be fundamentally different now than it, it was you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, a lot of the design principles that have been around for decades and you know, centuries and even some cases uh, are still, with, you know, are still are hold true today. Um, you know, you might need to rethink your approach to how you do your CSS, but your approach to how you do your design, um, that, that should be, uh, that, that should not have changed that much. So I'm going to go over what I think are some of the uh, pitfalls or uh, anti-patterns, um, whatever you want to call them, that I think a lot of uh, designers are falling victim to uh, nowadays. And so I just don't sound like someone who's being negative and complaining. I'm going to try to give what I think are some alternative approaches to some of these pitfalls to try to help you steer, steer clear of uh, the, you know, the minefield that web design is, is these days. So um, one really cool thing about you know, media queries is that for the first time you know, in history, it allows you to have one uh, website that's displayed to all of your users regardless of um, what kind of uh, screen they're using to access your device. And you can adjust the, the website based on, on those screen sizes. Um, so, and there's some advantages to this, like you don't need to have more than one website and you don't need to worry about, you know, having some redirect logic in your website. But, um, so I, I can definitely understand why this is the trend and I think this, the trend will continue for the, uh, towards this. However, I, I think in some cases, um, it, it still makes sense to go with a separate mobile and desktop version. So if somebody is going to be using your, your website or web application in fundamentally different ways on their phone versus their laptop or a tablet, um, you might want to consider going with separate uh, you know, versions of that, uh, of your website. You know, there's no uh, rule against that. Um, so that way you're not getting caught up in the trap of um, trying to have you know, content that's useful to uh, you know, both audiences because if, both audience, if you know, each audience is different or if it's the same audience, they're just using it differently depending on the context, it, it might just be the better approach just to go with completely separate versions. <laughs> and um, that leads me into my next point. Uh, I think a lot of designers are um, you know, choosing content for their projects based on its responsiveness. Um, and one example of this is that a lot of websites these days have you know, really large images. And if you, you know, play around with the size of your browser window, you can see how the images you know, scale up and down really nicely and you know, uh, look good at different dimensions. But in a lot of cases, the Im these images aren't really that important um, or they don't really add very much in the way of useful content to the website or, or whether, whatever it is. So. Um, you shouldn't get caught up in uh, choosing co uh, content based on its responsiveness. I think um, the best solution is to cho um, choose your content and then worry about making it responsive. Um, and you know, obviously, there, there would be some limitations to this, but you know, um, in, unless your con the content that you're adding to the site actually is useful to the user and uh, gets your message across or, or helps them, uh, you know, use your application or, or whatever it is you're working on. Um, you know, it really shouldn't be there regardless of how well it scales up, or in, up and down and so forth. Um, so one that I touched on earlier is um, the increasing commonness of uh, single column layouts. And uh, I can understand why designers like to use these on websites that are, um, you know, going to scale up and down because if you only have one column in your layout, it's a lot easier to work with that um, versus um, working with multiple columns. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there are ways that you can have multi, uh, you know, multiple columns in your layout and still have it adjust to different screen sizes. So um, you know, one use case would be if you have a blog and you want to have a sidebar uh, that displays like the latest posts and um, you know, maybe some other content, but that's content that you know, isn't really essential. So you could uh, display that on the larger screen sizes, but then you know, just completely hide it if someone's on their phone because they, it's not really essential that they see it just by you know, setting display none uh, using CSS. Um, or you could have you know, multiple columns where one column slides to the bottom on, on smaller screens. Um, so there are other ways you can approach this. And 
Uh, from a technical perspective, it's not all that different, uh, difficult, um, especially with some of the tools that are available uh, these days. So um, you don't need to make everything a single column layout um, in order to make it adapt well to different screen sizes. So um, a few years ago, uh, when you know media queries and responsive or, or, or whatever you want to call it design was becoming popular, um, a lot of the tutorials out there would tell you to set your uh, the breakpoints in your media queries um, based on you know things like what the dimensions of the latest iPhone was at the time and, and so forth. And at the time, that strategy was somewhat feasible because there was only a handful of phones that were really dominating the market. But you know, over the past couple of years, there's been an explosion in the number of phones and tablets that are available. So if you're trying to design for every screen size out there, you know, you're going to get caught in an infinite loop of you know, debugging and troubleshooting, and you're never going to be able to release. So uh, I think a better uh, approach is to treat every situa situation uniquely and design your breakpoints um, around what uh, content you have. Um, so, and, and this uh, is more challenging from, uh, from a design perspective in, in some respects because uh, you, you need to really think about, you know, um, do I set my breakpoint here um, to make my header text looks good or do I need to, you know, set it over here? Uh, and, but the, the upside is, is that you can have a lot fewer media queries and, uh, in your style sheet and your, your CSS can be a lot less complex overall. So I, I think that's the, uh, the better approach to take. So another one that I uh, touched on earlier, um, excuse me. Um, another one that I touched on earlier is um, having unnecessarily large elements on your screen, like having uh, really large hero images or um, header text that uh, is a lot larger than it needs to be. So uh, this is a screen cap of, uh, from a couple months ago. Um, and the Hollywood Reporter is not really a noteworthy website. I just uh, use this because it illustrates my point really well. So um, you can see the very bottom of the really large hero image up at the top, which was taking up the entire width of my uh, window. So, um, and this is the uh, screen cap of my entire 17-inch uh, uh, you know, monitor window. So, um, but I, I shrunk it down uh, a little bit so it would fit in the presentation. And um, in the middle there, you can see the really huge text. And the text is uh, you know, so big that it looks like it's screaming at you, uh, you know, and it looks like it's super duper important. But what's funny about this is this is not even the title of the article. This is actually the subtitle. So it, it gives you an idea of how out of whack some design, design elements can be because you know, I, I don't think the text is quite as important as the size uh, of it makes it out to be. So um, what, one way around this um, is to make sure that you're um, sizing the elements in relation to each other. Uh, and I think a big reason that um, you see a lot of oversized elements uh, in designs these days is because um, the developer or the designer in whatever it is in each case, um, they're sizing some elements in relation to the size of the screen, whereas other um, elements on the screen are being more, are more or less static. Um, uh, or if they do change, they don't change uh, nearly as drastically as other elements on the screen. Um, but one of the uh, fundamental principles of design um, is that you should size elements on the screen relative to their uh, importance. So if you have one um, block of text that's twice as large as a, uh, another block of text, that means that the first box is twice as important. So you want to make sure that you're always sizing the elements uh, you know, in relation to each other and, and remaining consistent uh, regardless of what kind of screen um, the, the content is on. And obviously, uh, it's not written in stone. You know, you, you can tweak it uh, a little bit based on your, each situation that you're in. Um, but you don't want to stray too far from it either. So you don't end up with, you know, huge text that, or a huge image um, that uh, looks, you know, the user would get the impression that, hey, this is really important, but, you know, it's really not. And it's also occupying way too much space on the screen. Um, so another one that I touched on earlier is um, there's the increasing tendency to uh, have information in grid format. So an example of this, um, this is a screen cap of the um, speakers page from the uh, CodeMash website. So let's say, for instance, uh, you were interested in uh, you know, going to the conference and you wanted to see all the speakers who are going to be there to see if there's anyone you recognize or anyone you know. Um, if you were to you know, scan all of this information, you'd have to go across each row 
to look at the pictures um, and then look at the names. And speaking of which, the, the names are probably a little small, um, but that's another subject. Uh, so, and if you're to do this, and you know, there's quite a few speakers there. There's you know, a couple dozen speakers, so if you're to do this throughout the entire page, that would uh, you know, take a lot of time and uh, mental energy unnecessarily. So I think um, a, a good way around that is you can still use tables. Um, you, you can, through CSS, uh, you can make the tables fluid width and you know, adjust to different widths. Um, but uh, you can, so you can still do that and, and st uh, still use the table layout with uh, columns and grids. So in this case, you could have you know, a column on the left that would have all of the uh, pictures and then uh, a column next to it that would have the uh, name uh, and description uh, depending on how, how you wanted to do that. So that way, if you wanted to look at all the speakers, you, know, you could just scroll down the page and you know, just scan everything really quickly um, rather than having to uh, you know, spend all this time and, and energy going through each going across each row and then all, all the way down the page. Uh, so um, one trend that I've been noticing a lot recently uh, is that um, content, uh, in a lot of cases, it, it expands to fill the entire width of the screen, kind of regardless of um, how big the screen is. So uh, to, to kind of illustrate the point in this case, um, I had my, my buddy who has like a 60 inch uh, you know, screen TV uh, and, and he plugs his computer into it. I had him load up the Wikipedia page for web design and set it to the highest resolution available. And you know, yep, it's, it's still occupying the entire width of the screen. And you can see the, uh, the paragraph up at the top. You know, each line of text is super long. So someone who's reading that, you know, when they get to the end of this line, it, that's a really long ways to get all the way over to that line. And you can also notice that the uh, links, you know, are all the way up in the corners of the screen. So this is the, the homepage link. And then, you know, you have to go all the way over to here to get to this set of links. So, um, and it's really easy to solve this from a technical perspective. Um, all, all you really have to do, um, you know, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of CSS. This really isn't a technical talk, but um, you can, just put all of your content in some sort of wrapper element and then just set the max width property on that. So that way it doesn't expand you know, uh, to a width larger than what makes sense, but it can still get smaller if you need it to, uh, if it's on a smaller screen size. Um, so another one that I touched on in the beginning is um, hiding the navigation even when uh, there's plenty of space to display it. So. Uh, and this is another one that's really not that hard to solve from a technical perspective. I mean, there's free CSS libraries you can download uh, to, to do this sort of thing. So uh, you can just display the navigation or at least some of the navigation on larger screens where there's room for it. And then, uh, you know, still hide it, um, uh, hide it and use the menu icon on, on smaller screens where every little bit of space is, is precious. Um, but on another note, if you are going to use the uh, a menu icon, Make sure that you have the word menu or something that is really obvious to the, uh, makes it really obvious to the user that this is a menu because uh, there have been surveys that have been done where you know a large number of people out there they don't necessarily realize that the, the hamburger icon that is so popular uh, is a menu and you can't really blame them because there's nothing really about three horizontal lines that indicates menu to someone who isn't you know uh, on you know using the latest web apps or you know mobile apps all day. So, um, so uh, that's kind of an, another subject topic, but uh, you know, again, you don't want to make it any harder on your user than it has to be. And if you are designing a website that you know is trying to sell them something or promote your business, you want them to see all the information that's available to them. You know, if they if they load your web page and they have to click on a button to load the menu, they they may or may not even click on that. So, you know, that that might be some content from your site that they'd be missing out on. So uh, up until this point, I've been basically just talking about um, things that you can do, uh, you know, uh, specific situations and how you can react to them. Um, but now I'm uh, going to be talking more about some things you can do to be proactive and, you know, try to just, um, you know, avoid these uh, problems before they even happen. And uh, one thing I think that doesn't get nearly enough attention when you're talking about um, making web pages scale up and down is using fonts that are scalable. And, 
You don't just want fonts that will you know, look good at a big size. You also want fonts that will be nice and readable even if they're being displayed at a really tiny size. Um, so up here I have some, the uh, same t text being rendered. Uh, uh, this is taken from a web browser, and it's the same text being rendered in both Arial and Verdana. And you can notice that the uh, text in Verdana is a lot more readable than uh, Arial. And as kind of a historical note, um, Arial was originally developed back in the 1980s, and the, uh, the primary design goal they had when they were developing it was to save screen space. So it, its primary design goal was not readability, and yet this is still you know, a pretty commonly used font on the web, uh, even today when you have uh, you know, hundreds uh, or thousands of other fonts available. So I, I think um, that you know, kind of illustrates my point about how little attention uh, you know, choosing the right font gets yet it, it's of critical importance. So, um, and also the, the font that I've been using in, in the presentation uh, is um, Droid Sans, and that's another um, example of a font that's scalable when you go up and down. So uh, there's a, a few things you want to look for when you're um, trying to find a font that'll still look, uh, be readable at small sizes, and you want to make sure there's enough spacing between the letters. Like, you know, it's on Arial, everything's really scrunched together, and that makes it kind of unreadable. Uh, whereas in like Verdana and uh, Droid Sands, everything's you know, nice and spaced out. So uh, it, it makes it a lot easier on your eyes. Uh, you want to make sure that there's a large X height. And uh, X height is uh, just a typography term that means the, basically means the height of a lowercase letter in a font. So you notice how like in uh, Verdana and, and Droid Sands, the lowercase letters have a nice you know, generous size. Uh, whereas in Arial, everything's kind of tiny. Um, you have well-defined bowls. So like on, on Droid Sands, you can see like the, the, the round part in the uh, lowercase e and lowercase a and so forth. Um, those are kind of, you know, over-exaggerated, uh, you know, which makes them nice and uh, readable. And, and uh, same thing to some degree on, on Verdana. And also um, visible ascenders and descenders. So uh, like you'll notice the, the tail on the, the G of, of uh, Droid Sands, that's, that's really noticeable, uh, you know, it has, um, because it's uh, a complete circle, basically. So th that would still be uh, readable, even if, if the font was still tiny. Um, so, uh, and like I said, there's, uh, you know, all kinds of fonts that you can use these days. Um, uh, you can use Verdana for free. Um, that one's been around since the 90s, uh, you know, available for web pages. Um, and you can also use, uh, you know, Font Face, and um, they're, they're, um, you can get Droid Sans for free through Google Web Fonts. And there's uh, plenty of fonts that you can use for free, as well as ones that you can pay for. Um, but in any case, there's really no good excuse for not using a, a font that you know, um, is readable uh, if what you're trying to do is, is make your, your website um, you know, read well on, on different screens. Um, another thing is, uh, I think it's really important to learn as much as you can about CSS. Um, the more you know about CSS, uh, the less constrained you'll be when you're making your design choices. Um, and, and, you, and you really want to be able to make the best design choices uh, for each situation and not um, be you know, forced to being, fall back on you know, the, the surefire thing that you know, that, that you know, you know how to do. And um, one point that I'd like to make is CSS gets a bad reputation. Um, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, it's so terrible, it's so ridiculous. And, um, you know, w once you, um, you know, get into it and once you read the documentation and read some good books behind it, um, I, I think you'll start to notice that there's a lot more, a lot of things about it make more sense than a lot of people realize. I, I think a lot of people just try to learn everything through trial and error because they think it's super easy and then they never take the time to, you know, read the do documentation and, and read, you know, <coughs> and really learn what they're doing. So whenever they run into trouble, they just blame things on the you know, supposed uh, badness of CSS. And then they go on the internet and make a silly animation about it rather than actually um, you know, taking the time to uh, read the documentation. So um, if, you know, if you've heard a lot of things about, oh, CSS is really terrible and, and so forth, you know, uh, try not to believe it. Um, so a good way to uh, you know, get good at CSS is to try to uh, get a lot of practice coding um, layouts from scratch. Uh, 
there, there's a lot of people nowadays um, have learned to use CSS um, through, uh, you know, frameworks. And a lot of the work that they've done is, you know, just been on top of frameworks. But um, the more practice you get, um, you know, building the layouts from scratch and trying to do as much as you can on your own, um, the, deeper under, the deeper understanding you'll have. And I'm not saying that you need to code every single project from scratch in your professional life, um, but uh, you, you want to have that capability um, so that you have that depth of knowledge and, you, um, and that way you understand what's going on with the framework as well. It, it doesn't just all seem like magic to you. Um, another good exercise is to try to take an old fix with uh, you know, design uh, and layout and try to retrofit it to be uh, responsive. And this is something I've done a few times and even as someone with, uh, you know, a considerable amount of experience with CSS, this was challenging even to me. Um, so, you know, this is something, it's not for, uh, you know, beginners necessarily, but if, if this is something you can tackle and, and even do somewhat well, I, I think it'll really strengthen your, um, your skills as both a developer and a designer, um, you know, and, and make you better prepared for, um, you know, making websites that you can use on all devices. Also, if, if you do any kind of work with CSS, um, it's important to at least understand the basics of design and uh, typography. And, um, you know, this is something I wrote for the, uh, the developer conference, so I don't know how much it applies here, but um, when I first started doing, you know, CSS, I, I would take uh, layouts in like uh, PSD form from a graphic designer and then implement that into CSS and HTML. And I did that for a couple of years and I think I did a, you know, a decent enough job at it. But it wasn't until I had been, you know, working with CSS and HTML for a while that it dawned on me like, hey, maybe I should, you know, pick up some books about design and typography and learn about what all this stuff is about. And, you know, once I finally did, I wish I had done it a lot sooner um, because I think it made me much better at working with CSS and, you know, uh, helped me make, you know, the finished product a lot better. So um, if, if you work with, uh, you know, CSS, it's important to at least understand the basics of design. And, uh, you know, conversely, if you're somebody who is a designer, um, you know, the more you can learn about CSS, the more uh, you'll be able to communicate with, you know, the developers on your team, even if that's not your um, primary function. Also, uh, you know, CSS developers don't get the uh, respect and appreciation they deserve, in my opinion. Um, I'm actually primarily a, a back-end developer these days. Uh, and I've done a, a fair amount of uh, back-end development. And, um, you know, the, the challenges aren't really the same, so um, they're kind of different challenges, so I, you can't really compare one to the other, you know, apples to apples, but I will say that, you know, CSS, it's, it's challenging to get really good at it, so, you know, uh, make sure that uh, whatever CSS developers you work with, uh, make sure that you let them know that you, you appreciate them, because I, I think a lot of them, you know, people assume that their job is easy when, you know, that's not really the case. Also, uh, if you're ever working on a layout, you know, test it on the largest screen you can find. If you're at the office, go into the conference room and plug it into the projector screen. If you're at home, you know, go find the largest TV you have and plug it into that, plug your laptop into that and, and load it up. Uh, because you want to see what it's going to look like for on the really large screens because you don't want to leave out the, the people who are browsing the web on their 60 inch, 60 inch television in their, their living room because they are out there and you don't want them to have a, a bad experience, um, you know, because you don't want anyone to have a bad experience when they're using your website. So uh, that about wraps it up. Um, that's me on Twitter and uh, GitHub and whatever else. Um, any questions or anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question is, I get that concept, but if your content varies greatly between pages, does that suggest that you're creating CSS and media queries for every single page of the site? I mean, I, I guess that's, um, you know, something you'd have to uh, take into consideration based on each uh, scenario. But, uh, you know, when, when you're designing for a site, you, you, you write, in some cases, you write custom CSS for each page. So if you need to write custom, you know, media queries for the custom CSS for each page, that, that might be worthwhile. But obviously, you, you don't want to get into uh, a, a, you know, situation where it's just unmaintainable. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that is, you know, something that you need to consider. That, that's a fair point.
Okay, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm not really a full-time uh, designer, so I don't have a, a ton of like examples that I can uh, bring up, but um, I'm not on the uh, wireless. Uh, what's what's the, uh, the password? Uh, which one is it under? Guest one. Oh, Gaslight. Okay. Unicorn Office. The unicorn. Okay. There it goes. So um, this is a, a website that I worked on um, for a, a bar slash live music venue in the Toledo area which, where I live. And uh, it's actually in Maumee, which is where um, you're from, right? Yeah, so, uh, so, and this is one that I originally created about five years ago and is originally a, a fixed width layout. Um, but then I, I took the, uh, the original design and, and updated it to be responsive. So. Um, you know, basically, this is what the desktop would have looked like um, before I, I did the changes. But so, for instance, you can see like uh, it stays the same up until here, and then you know, once, once the screen gets smaller, um, that goes to uh, two columns, you know, for each show, and then it goes to one. The entire thing collapses to one column when you, when you get really small, and then uh, it from there, you know. It, so, and when I was uh, doing that, um, you know, I, I basically just st started out with the, uh, the fixed width layout and I first tried to con uh, convert everything to, you know, using relative um, uh, 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 measurements rather than, you know, fixed, pixel, fixed pi pixels as much as I could. And then uh, basically just went through and tested it at different widths and, um, you know, wrote media queries uh, for each situation. So, and, and you can also notice that the, uh, the navigation up here is visible, but then uh, you, you have the menu uh, for the smaller screens. So um, that's the main page. Uh, then on here, uh, this is what, you know, a, a page for an individual show would look like. Um, so, and uh, yeah, there's, there's not, a, um, th this is a WordPress site, so y you know there could be text in here. So um, y you'll notice that the uh, the the title is is next to the uh, the picture at the top, um, and then as it gets smaller, it it drops down, and it, it the title goes from being left justified to being center justified uh, in the middle, and then you know once it gets really small, this uh, sorry I'm, I keep pointing at my own screen, but yeah. Uh, this sign over here, it just disappears completely um, once it gets to the really small screen. So uh, does, does that help to illustrate some of what I was talking about? Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you bring up a good point. Like, a lot of what I've learned about CSS would be when I was browsing the web, you know, uh, in just my, you know, when I was bored or whatever, if I noticed something that, hey, that looks cool, I wonder how the, the CSS is for that, you know, I, I would just use the, the web inspector built in my browser to look at it, and then I would, I would learn something new. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good way to learn about CSS, both good and bad. Um, you know, you, you can also get examples of what not to do um, by, by doing that. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a good point that you bring up. 
Anyone else? All right.